And I think men need to understand this, that there are certain people you pick who are very strong at what they do, but you only understand their strengths because you socialize with them. Mm. So when you have to pick women who might not be in your social circle, you have to go a little further. It's not going to be an easy thing. And I don't want them to think it's going to be easy for them to find amazing women mm. in the sense that they might not know them because abapuzi mm. nabo. Do you know what I'm saying? They have to be intentional about saying, every time I pick a sipo and tabo, I'm going to find a lebu and nomdeni as well. Yes. Because what you see often happening is there are specific women who are always in areas of opportunity. Yep. And that is because sometimes the people that pick don't want to do the homework. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Lebo Lion Show, the biggest marketing and entrepreneurship podcast on the African continent. Guys, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, do the right thing so that this podcast can be heard and seen by all the right people. Let's grow this community. And as you know, I always have a phenomenal guest in the pipeline for you. And today's guest, guys, if you are in the entertainment industry, if you're a female entrepreneur, and if you're somebody who really wants to create a life that they love from the ground up, then this is the person you need to be listening to. Take out your notepads, get the pen, get the tea or something nice, and sit down somewhere quiet and get ready to listen to our next guest. And as you know, on this podcast, we do not introduce the guests, they introduce themselves. <laughs> So, Nomdeni, <laughs> welcome to the Level Line Show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule, flying all over the world. Oh my Thank gosh. you so How much. The, when did we get there? <laughs> oh, when did you get there? You've been she's been jet setting all over the world. So, we're really privileged to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Please introduce yourself. Oh Who is Nomdeni? Jeez. It's always so difficult to, to introduce myself. I think for a lot of people, it's, it's an intense question. I always say, ah, oh, please don't ask me that. Just <laughs> read whatever I sent you or something. But I always just, um, man, I'm a girl from Newcastle, uh, in Matadeni. I grew up there and I'm an entrepreneur mm. and I'm a mom to two amazing kids. I'm the CEO and founder of a platform business called Agenda Woman. Um, maybe that's important in this conversation, but generally, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a mom, and I'm just a girl like all the girls that are watching. She says she's just a girl like all the <laughs> girls that are watching. I don't know about that, <laughs> but we'll uncover her story and you guys will get to decide. So I want to, because I met you, I think about, oof, I was thinking about years that ago. actually uh, before coming here. Um, it was 2019. Really? It was 2019 when I sit down with you, yeah. but you then told me that you met me in 2017. Before, yeah, yes, I met you a long time ago. I know, it's wild. It yeah, was crazy it's, it's when you wild. told me. And you were there with DJ Zintle, and you were both talking about talent on the African continent, yes, um, the DJ and Mosquito, school, and Gwedo Luka, and, and Zipo 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 Exactly, okay, all of you were yes, on the panel at yes, Standard Bank, I yes. remember that, and my friend was hosting the event. Um, so she was like, you have to come yes, and meet yes, this incredible yes, yes, lady yes. called Nom Dani, I love her so much. I was like, okay, I'll come. And look, she wasn't wrong, you are really phenomenal. Oh, thank you. When did you start? Like, how do you even say to yourself, I want to become an entrepreneur? Yeah. How did that happen? It was, it was by chance for me. Um, it, it's, it's ironic, you know, sometimes in hindsight, just kind of connect the dots, you mm. know, cliche, but it is true. I grew up in an entrepreneurial home, but I didn't know, mm. right? I didn't know, no one worked at my house in the sense that no one had a nine to five. They didn't wake up and go to work. Mm. And I only realized it literally years into being an entrepreneur that, okay, maybe this is something that I saw around me. But in making the decision to become an entrepreneur, it was really not, um, I didn't sit down and say, I want freedom and I want to be an entrepreneur <laughs> and I want to change the world. It wasn't that at all. I um, studied marketing uh, at Vets Technicon, Bunting Road. Wow. 
in Orton Park. Um, so that gives away my age a bit because it was in University of Johannesburg yet. And when I finished, I uh, had my first child in 2005. Mm. So I took a, a year off, like doing nothing. And it's literally still one of the best years of my life. I wow. got to see everything, you know. And I think it's important maybe in, um, you know, when we, we continue to speak, you'll understand why I think... Um, it's important to highlight this. It really was one of the best years of my life. I got to spend time with her. We would just wake up, roll around, do the routine, read the books, you know, when you're a new mom. That's all I did for about a year. After that, I worked at Multi Choice for two seconds. I always say two seconds <laughs> because literally I had so much fun. I met so many people, but mm -hmm. I wanted more, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time everyone was talking about discovery. And uh, even when I went to Multi Choice, I was always fascinated by the founder story, you know. Mm -hmm. I just thought, wow, you know, how amazing it is to start something from nothing and it becomes Multi Choice. And uh, then I heard about discovery. And I always kind of was intrigued by founder stories because even when I heard about discovery, I went and I researched who the founder is. And I got obsessed, obviously, with Adrian Gore. Mm -hmm. And I applied and I worked at discovery also for two seconds because uh, <laughs> whilst I was at training, I found out that I was pregnant. Okay. And um, then I went on maternity. When I came back, I was like, oh, this is not for me, you know. I uh, was a ambitious 20 year old. I don't want to use the word rebellious, you know, but I think it's the that spirit that entrepreneurs have where you're just like, I want to know more. I don't want to just take instructions. Like, how does this business work? What, how, what are the revenue channels? Like, what is the, the balance sheet looking like? How do they do it? What are the decisions they make in the boardroom? In actual fact, there was a program that they had at Discovery where you could apply when you're an employ, employee to sit with the executive team and kind of give them insights of what's happening on the ground. That excited me, you know? And I applied for that and I got uh, accepted then my direct manager was like, no, we won't take you there, you know, we think there's someone else that we want to take in the team who didn't even apply. Wow. And for me, that was it. I was just like, no one swears in this podcast. So yes, that's what you I said. You can swear if you want to. <laughs> so I was just like, nah, this is not for me. Yeah. Um, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, that day when they called me to have the conversation with me, I went back to my desk, I typed my resignation and I left. It just, it just never suited me. The environment was frustrating for me. I, I get bored easily. So around the same time, Zintle was talking to me about studying a DJ in school. I really didn't have ambitions to study DJ in school. I was not in the entertainment space at all. But her career was kind of starting to, to form. And she was like, you know, I went to the Soul Candy. I was the only girl there and it was really uncomfortable. Um, I want to study DJ in school. We didn't say it was girls. We just mm. thought we want to study DJ in school. So I left and um, I left my job and I found our first location, which was in Melville. I was literally driving around. I've always been, um, it excites me to create systems, mm. you know, to come up with solutions. So when she told me, maybe for her, it was like, ah, it's something I'm thinking about. For me, I was like, okay, we're doing this thing, you know? <laughs> so that's how I got into entrepreneurship. It was really, I went into corporate and it just didn't work for me. And um, I guess I had the, the support, you know, from my now ex-husband to kind of take that leap. Mm. Um, although it was not conscious, I recognize now how important it was to have someone, you know, there. Because I just had a kid, you know. Mm. My baby was still a baby baby. And I went ahead and I did it. And of course, I was a little crazy. A little crazy. They little say crazy. entrepreneurs have a little bit of madness in there. I definitely do. Wow, I definitely do. And you're such a small, like you're tiny, guys. <laughs> Nomdeni is this tiny little lady, but they say dynamite comes in small packages. It's right? so crazy. Everyone is always like, you know, when I get when I speak to people on the phone and then they meet me, they're yeah. like, oh, we thought we were gonna speak to an older lady, and I'm just like, oh, okay, this is me, you know, this is you. Um, yeah, I, I a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. So how did you navigate through corporate in the short time that you were there? Because there are lots of people who watch this podcast who are working in corporate and are trying to decide if they should go into entrepreneurship or just have a side hustle. Mm. So as someone with an entrepreneurial sp spirit where you are, you, you literally can't, yeah, sit can't sit still, how did you navigate through corporate? How did you make it enjoyable for yourself? You know, um, that is such a romanticized conversation now. Mm -hmm. um, the story I'm telling you about is like 28, 2008, 2018, 2008. 2008 mm. um, I had no clue what entrepreneurship was mm. I had no insight into any conversations around entrepreneurship um, so I can't even tell you that I had an, a, a plan you know mm. of navigating corporate I think I was one of those people and I think there's a lot of young women like this in South Africa where you're just told you need to go to school uh, you need to finish university when you finish university you get a job I don't think I really had a chance to figure out who I am mm. and what I love 
and how this corporate world works, you know. The primary thing was to just get a job and get paid, you know. Um, when I did do the, when I was in corporate, the few hours that I was there, um, there was nothing to navigate for me, you know. I just was like, I was feeling very uncomfortable, I was very unprepared for it. Um, but I've always been a fighter, so in any environment where you can put me, I will always figure out how to navigate it. But I just really, really did not like it. I did not want to figure it out. I knew that I wanted to be Adrian Gore, and I knew that to become Adrian Gore at Discovery, it's like 10 million years of my life, mm. and that's the thing that, you know, that lights my fire. So I just recognized that I'm not going to get to it. I'm not going to do what I want to do here, because I don't want to say I don't want, I'm not going to get to, because I had no intention of getting to it, mm. you know, but I knew what really excited me yeah. and what excited me was the decision making you know it was the risk taking it was understanding the bigger scope of socioeconomic impact you know and I can use that word now in 2008 I didn't know what it was mm. but now in hindsight I can kind of describe what I was feeling so I think for anyone right now with uh, the information that I have and being older and wiser I wouldn't say it's so funny when I was when I was in the car coming here they were talking about um, quitting your job because something <laughs> happened that you yeah. hate and how bad that is. I never advise anyone to leave their job, mm. even as an entrepreneur, because I always say it's wild here. It's wild. It's <laughs> wild here. Even for my kids, it's yeah. not something I think I would want them to do, mm. but I recognize that it's something that you can't really dictate you know, to people. Mm. So if you are feeling unsettled, the smart thing really is to plan. Because entrepreneurship has to do with a lot of planning. Mm. And if you fail to plan in that space, you're going to definitely struggle for the first five years of entrepreneurship. Mm. Not only emotionally, like psychologically um, and financially, if that's not a trait that you have, it's going to really be something that's a hindrance in your entrepreneurship journey. Mm. So if you're still working and you're thinking about entrepreneurship, I want to challenge you to really plan, mm. figure out where you're gonna get the money, what you're doing with the money that you have right now. I actually have a cousin who wanted to be an entrepreneur and I could I was just listening to him and I was like, oh Shane, this is not gonna work for you. <laughs> and happen. he came and he did it without without taking the advice I'd given him and now he's back working. Mm. Because here's the thing, it's also very difficult on you emotionally to go through that process of coming out and going back into the system. So before you come out of the system, the system can be your investor. Mm. I always encourage people to look at their employers as investors for the business that they want to build. Don't look at it as this person is making me do something. Think about it, this is an opportunity where I can make money. I would love to figure out how to make more money outside of the business that I'm building, you know? Mm -hmm. But I recognize that I'm too far down the line, I just have to figure out other things. But think of your employer as your first investor. What can you do with the money that you're making? And if you can't make the sacrifices to free up money now, you're not gonna make them as an entrepreneur as well. Ah, that is so wise. Think of your employer as your first investor. Absolutely. And not just a financial investment, it's the time, it's the educational, the knowledge, all of it together is a real investment. That's what you look for in a mentor, right? Absolutely. That's what we look for. So that's, that's deep. You have to go, uh, you have to re literally look around the business and think, okay, what is that person's role? Why are they important to the business? What is my role? Start to really think about even the company that you're working for as an entrepreneurial field because mm. someone owns it, yes. right? Think about the decisions they, they need to make, how they are hiring, why the policies look the way that they look. Not because you want to challenge it, but there's so much insight that you can gather just from speaking to the people that work for the, for the organization. What questions did they ask you when they were hiring you, you know? Mm. Um, get as much information and intelligence as you can in the organization and start to think about how yours is going to be structured. Don't do that crazy thing of just jumping out and saying, I'm going to sell a Mabuinya, and you have no idea of how you're going to support your family. It's just, it's one of those things where you can learn from the people, Abahambe Pamwak, you know? Mm. You don't have to suffer, you know? Not everyone has to suffer when they come into entrepreneurship. There's smart ways to do this thing, and you have to really, really be invested. You're not going to sleep at midnight, unfortunately. You're going to be at work at the time that you have to be at work. You're going to come back home and you're going to work for your business. You're going to sleep late. And if you're young, it's the time really to do it. In your 20s, that's when you have the energy. Really, really um, spend the time thinking about how you're going to structure this thing. Don't, mm. please, not another person calling me and saying, I want to leave my job. Why? <laughs> Why are you leaving your job? How are you going to leave your job? Like, let's really have a a planned conversation and not yeah. just that this is how I feel. I call it entrepreneurship porn. Oh, the idea gosh. that we romanticize the freedom 
of owning your own business and your own time, but it's actually much harder than being employed. Absolutely. You know? If you're the kind of person who likes peace and consistency and predictability, do you think it's important for an entrepreneur to be formally educated? So to have a university degree? I, it's a very tricky one, right? I think the right education system, <laughs> the right education system that is positioned to create that. Mm. So for instance, I'll speak the, about the African Leadership Academy, you know, with Frank uh, Swanika and Acha, you know, when you walk into that, into that institution, the mission is to make you a leader. Mm. Whether it's in entrepreneurship, whether it's a president, you know, I think for me, those institutions are better positioned to create entrepreneurs that can thrive in the world because mm. the, the class allows you to engage in a way that an entrepreneurial mind would want to engage. So I don't think the entire education system as it exists today is built for that. Um, I think education is important. Um, formal education and informal education. I think there is something around, you know, the amount of work that, um, you know, people who build curriculums, you know, um, go through, you know, the, the research that they do. I don't want to minimize it and, and say it's nothing. I do mm. think that our education system from a primary school to high school is really not geared up for the type of world that we're living in today. I don't mm. think so. And I have kids in the same education system. I do think that there are schools much more privileged schools that um, afford the luxury to to recreate much quicker than our public schools. You know, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's unfortunate, but um, I never want people to think of themselves as unfortunate. You know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to really explore how they educate themselves, how they go into mentorship relationships that allow them to better understand what it is that they want to do. Um, but I think our education system as it exists today is really not geared up for the pace at which the world is changing. I have to agree with you on that one. And thank you for answering it so honestly. Mm. Um, I think, especially as women, female entrepreneurs, I think sometimes we tend to PR that answer. And we'll say, oh, but I love my country, and it's such a beautiful place, I and we should all have education well. degrees. And you're like, but let's be <laughs> no, honest. I, you love, know? I, really, yes. I really love South Africa, and, and mm. you know, I travel a lot. Yes. So I engage with many, many cultures. And I love being South African, and I mm. love this country. I think we do have challenges, and I think um, all of us in our different, um, you know, areas will be influential in how we address the challenges. But um, not speaking about the challenges is not going to make them go away. We do have a challenge in the education system, yes. and um, I wish our leaders understood the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. I don't think they live in our world. Yes, I don't think they live in our world, and I think that's why sometimes it's challenging for them to come up with solutions that are relevant for 2022. Yes. So um, I understand leadership is a big job, so I also don't want to minimize that. Mm. But um, I wish they were more liberal in how they sourced solutions. Mm. And inclusive, you know, and collaborative. Absolutely. Like, you know, you can't create solutions for people whose experiences you don't understand. So yeah. bring them in the room. Absolutely. You know, don't just create solutions for them. Make them the solution as well. Yeah. I want to go back to when you started off and you just had your first baby. And I want to talk about partners. How important is, is it to have a supportive partner? Or how important is your decision in terms of the partner that you have as a woman um, in the life that you end up building and the person you end up becoming. Mm. It's very important. Mm. It's so important. And, um, you know, one of the things that um, drives me about a gender woman is addressing stuff like this, you mm. know, because when I uh, got married, I met my ex-husband when I was 19, you know, and um, I got married when I was 24. I realize now how little I knew of who I was, mm. right? But the way Kuliswanga Kona, especially as girls, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe speak about it from a um, A type personality, mm -hmm. right? Um, you do well at school, and you're admired for doing well at school. You're encouraged to do well. You're encouraged to go to varsity. You know, you don't have space for a lot of mistakes mm. when you're an A type personality. And I think mm -hmm. mistakes are important. Mistakes are so important. If there's a parent who's watching this, I want you to get very comfortable with your kids making mistakes and making mistakes very young 
teenagers are meant to make mistakes mm. of course as parents we need to make sure they don't die mm. because teenagers <laughs> can't go that far i'm raising I'm, i have two teenagers now yeah. but teenagers are supposed to make mistakes you know those developmental stages of just figuring out who you are it's important and i think for me because i was following a prescribed route for myself mm. because i had to be good you know i had to be good i'm good at school i'm good at home it does come with challenges at a later stage, right? And of course, everyone's gonna have their life. Um, so I, I, when I met my ex-husband, who is really an amazing person and was very, very supportive to me, I realized though that I had not fully formed into who I was, mm -hmm. you know? Um, he was five years older than me, so maybe he might have been at a better position. And of course, he was a boy from Soweto, so he had done yeah. a lot, you yeah. know? <laughs> he had done a lot, you know? Um, but really, really amazing um, to me. Um, having kids at a young age, I always say to my kids, guys, do you realize your dad could have left me? Mm. You know? Um, but I was lucky, you know, we got married, we had, an, we had an amazing relationship. I think it's so important for young women to understand who they are before they become part of a unit. Mm. I think it just sets you up for a better chance of success in the sense that even when you pick, you are much more intentional about how your partner fits into your plan. Without a plan, you can't pick a partner who fits into a plan. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? You pick a partner who your parents expect you to pick. You pick a partner who is perceived to be good in society mm. and by community standards. But I think everyone um, has a partner that is better suited to them from a personality point of view. And you can't pick that partner when you don't understand who you are yet. Mm. So I want to encourage women to take their time when it comes to picking partners and date a lot. Date a lot. Date a lot. But how do you date past the stereotype of being labeled funny things? Because now, women being liberated in that way isn't something that society celebrates, right? Yeah. So the the prescribed route is go to school, do whatever, date one person, mm, and <laughs> marry, marry the them. person. So when you date, everyone around you is like, oh, this girl is loose, she's whatever, she's whatever. How do you navigate through that? How do you date freely? Mm. You know, I think the, the, the home as a support structure is so important to a lot of these things. Mm. And it's unfortunate that we don't have a lot of homes like that. I can't imagine that for my daughter it will be challenging, mm. you know, because it's something I would encourage her to do, you know. Mm. Of course you have to be careful. Of course, unfortunately, you have to be conscious of these biases mm. because we don't live in a world where you can escape them yet. Mm. And the work that we're doing is that the world in the future becomes that. But I always shy away from, you know, encouraging people to to be um, liberated in a way that can be detrimental for their success. Mm. I think it's important to be strategic, even as you understand that this is something, there's nothing wrong with me dressing this way, yes. right? There's nothing wrong with a woman dressing any particular way. But if you want to get in specific rooms, you have to be strategic. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. as we do the work of changing these ideologies and stereotypes, we still need to be strategic. Mm. You can't do it from the outside. You can't do it as a rebel. You know, so of course there'll be people who'll be, you know, um, on the streets who will be challenging these stereotypes in a big and bold and loud way. Then there'll be people like me who will be more conservative, understanding that there's nothing wrong with what everyone else is doing, mm -hmm. but recognizing that there is work that still needs to be done yeah. in these conservative spaces for change to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the support structure is quite crucial, who you have around you as a, as a, as a young woman and as a woman in general, the mm -hmm. conversations that you're having. I recognize that, like I said, for my daughter, it might not be something too challenging because she has access to a space where she can speak openly and I'll be able to guide her around. Listen, if you do this, there will be consequences that look like this. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But in this space, in this world that we live in, maybe that's not what is going to get you ahead. But maybe if you move to Norway, it's a different culture. A different if you culture. move to London, it's a different culture. If you mm. move to New York, it's a different culture. But I think it's quite important to be strategic. But I think it's also important to have women who will say, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I want to say this so clearly. You know, every time people hear about a gender woman in the events, they're like, ah, oh, another branch, ah, oh, this and that. You will never step into a room that has the most organic, authentic, beautiful energy like in a gender woman event. Mm. Like I can put my life on the line. My gift is to be able to create energy in spaces like that. Mm. And because of the purity of my intention when I walk into that space, I will tell you that I need you to come here 
and be very clear about the fact that no one even cares about how much money you make yes. or how well dressed or not well dressed you are or what bag you're, you're, you're carrying. In this space, we are women connected by each other's stories, mm. you know, but what by what we've all been through. And I still need to find the words to, to describe this in my marketing. Marketing? <laughs> But that's the magic. Yes. That's the magic when it comes to the rooms that I curate and the spaces that I bring together. That I actually really do care about every woman's experience that's in the room. Because I know there's someone in that room who's already feeling intimidated by seeing label. Yeah. And I'm the person who will walk to that person and say, hi, how are you? Why are you sitting here? Why are you not talking to everyone? Mm. Come, let me introduce you to someone who I think you'd want to meet. I do that at my events. Mm. So I love the space that I've created through Agenda Woman. And it wasn't really inspired by um, social networks and connections. It was really inspired by my entrepreneurial journey and how lonely it was mm. and how much information I needed but didn't know where to go. How much I needed a space where I could talk about my challenges and be heard by someone who understands those challenges. I was around a lot of men when I came into the industries that I worked in. And even just as an entrepreneur, I was around a lot of men, you yes. know. And um, I longed for a place where I could say, I don't know how to create a rate card for a multi-global company. Because mm -hmm. it's different. Mm. Creating a rate card as an influencer or creating, saying to someone, this is how much I charge versus going into a, a global company and saying, these are my rates and this is how I justify them. And this is different. how I run my business. Mm. And these are the processes and systems. It was very hard. It was very hard and extremely intimidating. I'll tell you, it was actually a woman CEO who I was connected to by a male mentor who helped me build my first rate card mm. for a company, mm. you know? When I started doing like communication strategies for big companies, I had no clue how to charge them. And I still charge them very little. I still charge them very, very little. And um, I was negotiated down and it's sad, mm. you know, that no one was next to me to say, that's too far down. Because I really wanted the job. Yes. I really, and you really want wanted to prove the yourself job. and you want to show them. And it was detrimental at mm. a later stage that that's how that relationship started. But um, I started a general woman to create a space where women can come and say, I'm looking for this and I can go and source it for them and share it through an article on our platform, share it through a social media post, share it in a room when we're mm. having conversations. That's what we're building towards, you know. I don't know if that's what we look like now, but that's what we're building towards to be a place where women can talk about what they need yes. and actually have a direct answer, yes. i.e. go and find it. Mm. Like there's certain spaces, there are certain times where you need someone to research, but there are certain times where you need to just, just give someone answer. an answer. Yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> and this idea of just making it hard for people is really not necessary sometimes. Absolutely. I'm around a lot of men. Men help each other. All the time. All the time. Boys club is they not a don't myth. say go and research. They yes. say I will make the call now yes. to this person, mm -hmm. go and talk to them and do this and that and that. And I think mm -hmm. it's important for me to create uh, that for female entrepreneurs. Mm. Because a lot of times there's also the dynamics of male and female mentors and all of that. Um, and I've been very lucky. I've had a lot of male mentors who have been really, really mentors to me, who believed in what I believed in, who I had fights with, mm. who I cried in front of, who cried because they feel like they're not <laughs> helping me. Um, so, yes, the social networking part of Agenda Woman is a crucial one, but the key one was about really creating a space where women could go and just ask a question and get an answer. Absolutely. And the, the reason why I'm saying absolutely is because I had like two things I wanted to say and then I was like, which one do I pick? Um, but I, I've experienced a gender woman and I think it's a brilliant platform that you've started. I mean, I remember there was one time, I don't know what was happening, but I had posted you in my stories and I got so many DMs from women saying, oh my gosh, you know Noam Dani, she has a gender woman. It's amazing. Really? I love that platform. People are really invested in that movement because I think they see themselves in it, you know? Mm. So congratulations on building something so impactful. Thank you. Now I want to ask you a really hard question. I think this is a, a tricky question to okay. ask. But for the men watching our podcast, what can they do to support and help female entrepreneurs and women in corporate who they lead? Mm. What can they do to be our brothers and to support us for real? It's, 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 it's not so much a, a difficult question, and I'll tell you why. Mm. Because my mentors and the, and the men in my life have created safe spaces for me to have these conversations with them, it's allowed me insight into how much they don't understand what's happening with women. And 
some of course hyenas and i don't want to you know i don't want to i don't want a woman who's been through a tough situation to say I'm, I'm you know maybe i'm being delusional you know but a lot of men sometimes in leadership positions have no deep understanding of what showing up as a woman in workspaces feels and looks like mm. so i sat with one of my mentors someone in a very high position in in, in one of these um companies in south africa and um, I spoke to him about just how young women perceive him. Something simple like that. And how he needs to be careful about what he receives from young women. Mm. D does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Um, when we're young as women, there's a lot that we're still trying to figure out. I think when you're just a young person, there's a lot that you're still trying to figure out. And I want to tell the men that are listening to this that when they engage with young women in the workspace, they are in a position of power. Mm -hmm. They are in a position of power. And young women see them as people in position of power. And the honors and responsibility for how that relationship evolves is on them. Thank you. As people who are in a powerful position. Um, Please, guys, <laughs> rewind. And then listen to it again and rewind and listen until you understand. Sorry, it's important. continue. Yes, it's it's so important. I, I, when when men think when they engage young women in the workplace, they are engaging an equal, an equal, <laughs> you know, or someone with uh, the wisdom that they would have acquired over the years, having access to specific rooms. They're mm -hmm. wrong. Um, young women want to succeed, and sometimes they take the lead around which road to take from the men that lead them. Mm -hmm. The unspoken things. It's so important when men lead that they are very intentional about how they lead women. You can't say I'll have an umbrella approach to leading everyone in my team. In the same way that it might not even be gender specific, even personalities, mm -hmm. you have to lead different personalities differently. When you are a parent, you raise your kids differently based on who they are. Mm. When, when men lead, they have to have an agenda for the woman that they lead. Mm. Don't take it as an umbrella approach. You as a man need to decide that in everything that I do, I'm going to have a specific number of women. Mm. I don't care how difficult it is to find them. It must be your intention at all times. There's a friend who spoke to me about a project that he was doing that was going to have access to a big budget. And someone that I respect well, very well who respects me as well. And they told me, oh, I just called Lebu. And I, oh, maybe let me not use Lebu. I just called Sipo and Tabo, mm. you know. Sipo and Tabo are brilliant, yes. by the way. Yes. Sipo and Tabo are brilliant. Just called Sipo and Tabo to put this thing together. It's such an amazing opportunity. We're going to do amazing stuff, this and that. And I said to him, that's amazing. But when you were thinking about people to put together with, for this project, there was not one woman you could think of. Mm -hmm. Number one, when I asked the questions, I, I realized that it's not even in his radar. It's not. To think that way, mm. right? Um, not because he has anything against women, but because he socializes with Sipu and Tabo. So he knows Sipu and Tabo's strengths. And I think men need to understand this that there are certain people you pick who are very strong at what they do but you only understand their strengths because you socialize with them mm. so when you have to pick women who might not be in your social circle you have to go a little further it's not going to be an easy thing and i don't want them to think it's going to be easy for them to find amazing women mm. in the sense that they might not know them because mm. do you know what i'm saying they have to be intentional about saying every time i pick a sipo and tabo I'm going to find a Lebu and Nomdeni as well. Yes. Because what you see often happening is there are specific women who are always in areas of opportunity. Yep. And that is because sometimes the people that pick don't want to do the homework mm -hmm. of finding another woman and the next one and the next one and the next one. Mm -hmm. And of course, the honest is also in the woman to say, yes, Konomuni. Yes. But it's not natural also, Uguti, Abantu, share their checks. It's just not a natural thing. Mm -hmm. I always want to take it a step further and say, okay, what is your social environment, you know, as the person making the decision? And where do these people connect in your social environment? Is this someone's wife that you know? Mm -hmm. um, because naturally, even when you pick your guests, you pick people who you know, mm -hmm. or who you've engaged with, you know, or people that you've heard about or seen. It's a natural thing that we, we, we always go to, to a specific space. 
and it's gonna be risky at times but that's what it's going to take to change things around mm. and that change comes with so much for us as a society as a whole yes from it from the top in terms of leadership to the bottom yes one of the reasons i love rwanda is just how many oh, women are in incredible. leadership positions yes and yeah. having spent time around the, the president i can tell you it's not something that happened by chance yes it was intentionality yes so for all the male leaders that are, are listening and all the male managers, you might not be the CEO or CFO, you might be a manager who has a team, it has to be intentionality. And when you don't have that intention, it's going to show. Mm -hmm. And you can't fake that intention. You have to want to see women succeed because you have sisters, you have a baby girl or whatever. Because I want to encourage people sometimes to go there. Mm. You don't need to do it because of that reason. Yeah. But sometimes to build that empathy, I just want you to think about what you would want for the people that you love, the woman that you love. Yeah. And create space for that in the small areas of influence that you have. I love what you're saying because it touches on women supporting each other when they have networks, men supporting women, how men are socialized, mm. they everyday experience and the fact that it usually doesn't even involve women. Absolutely. And that's scary to me because yeah. I'm like, what, where are you in life that on a daily basis when you're doing the things that matter, there are no women around? Mm. You know, that There's means a lot all the that. money that's flowing and opportunities never see a woman's hands. Absolutely. And that is scary. And it happens easily, level. <laughs> it happens so easily because I guess maybe that's just how men are socialized. You know, they want to go into their spaces and drink and talk all the things that they want to talk um, because that's what they have expected their lives to look like now. But it has to be about sitting down and deciding as a leader that this is how you're going to change things around. I have a friend who is a very influential leader, not in South Africa, who came into an organization that had two women wow. and right now has about 30% of his staff as women. Mm. Not because it happened by chance. He made that decision mm. that he's going to find women to fill specific positions because also he just believes that there is something around having women in particular positions mm. and the detail that they can offer, the insight that they can offer and how much they make the organization better. Thank you so much for coming. Guys, you know how we do. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Listen, these are gems that Norm Jenny has shared. And if you share this with other people, you will be changing somebody's life. So please do it. And don't forget that if you want to get in touch with us for any advertising purposes, all you have to do is contact us on the email that's on the banner below and look at everything that we're sharing in the descriptions if you want to know about Agenda Women or anything else. Until next time, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time.